Welcome everyone. My name is Elijah Butterfield and I am CEH's Environmental Justice Fellow and I will be your host today. And welcome to Reopening with Reusables during COVID-19, a transition to green and healthy schools. Just so we can get a sense of who is on this webinar, I'm gonna pull up a couple of polling questions for you all. All right, looks like we have predominantly government folks followed by K-12 schools and nonprofits and NGOs. A couple more quick questions for you related to the challenges that your organization is facing during transitioning to reusable foodware. It looks like the biggest barrier right now is administrative, so buy-in, time, and there might be a couple more other issues hidden behind that. I've got one more question for you all. What are your organization's views on the safety of reusable foodware during the COVID-19 pandemic? So it looks like the vast majority, or not the vast majority, but the majority of you view reusable foodware just as safe as single use, followed by less safe, and then reusables being more safe than single use foodware. Thank you all so much for sharing. A little background on us, CEH protects people from toxic chemicals, by working with communities, consumers, workers, governments, and the private sector to demand and support business practices that are safe for public health and the environment. We're proud to be presenting today with two school districts in Massachusetts that are piloting the transition from single-use foodware to healthier, more sustainable reusables as they reopen during COVID-19. I'd like to introduce Sue Chang, the Pollution Prevention Director at the Center for Environmental Health, Jackie Dillenbach, the School Nutrition Specialist and Director of School Services at Ralph C. Mahar Regional and the Orange Elementary School Districts, and Janice King, Food and Nutrition Director, Educator and Health Coach, Consultant and Trainer at Auburn Public Schools. Before we hop in, here's a little primer on what you can expect to learn and take away today. You'll be able to recognize the risks towards student and environmental health associated with toxic chemicals and single-use service, food serviceware, including chemical migration into food, water, and compost. We'll discuss the safety of reusable food serviceware, identify tools, policies, and resources to help purchasers identify safer foodware, food serviceware products. And you'll also hear how school districts are overcoming sustainability challenges with food service operations during COVID-19. Sue, would you like to take it away? Uh, sure, thanks for the introduction. Um, so as Elijah mentioned, so my name is Sue Chang uh, with the Center for Environmental Health. And um, as he mentioned already, we our mission is to protect the public from exposure to toxic chemicals. And one of the areas that we're focused on is a class of chemicals that are known as endocrine or hormone disrupting compounds. They're called EDCs for short. Um, we're particularly concerned about them because these are synthetic human-made chemicals that can mimic, block, or alter the activity of our body's natural hormones. And they do this at incredibly minute doses. Um, so they can, they're associated with a whole host of health, adverse health effects such as diabetes, obesity, reproductive harm, uh, cancers, and other diseases. And we're very concerned because they are, um, the fetuses, babies, and young children are particularly vulnerable. You know, they're growing um, and developing so rapidly. And so there's a lot of changes that are happening in the body that can be negatively affected by these hormone disrupting chemicals. Um, and these things can have lifelong and sometimes even uh, multi-generational impacts. So one of the groups of chemicals though that we're concerned about is uh, known as per and polyfluoroalkyl substances or PFAS for short. It's a group of roughly 5,000 chemicals in this class. And um, the image you see on the left is just a carbon fluorine bond, which is one of the strongest bonds in chemistry and it's given this group of chemicals the nickname the forever chemicals because they cannot be broken down by natural systems. Mm -hmm. And um, so they end up, you know, sticking around for a really <clears throat> long time and can build up in the environment. 
they're found um, in virtually all of us in our bodies and are found all over the world. So you can also find these chemicals, unfortunately, in a wide variety of products that we're likely to use or come into contact with every day. You're um, likely already familiar with them as stain treatments for textiles, furniture, and carpet, or for water resistance for outdoor rain gear or in nonstick cookware. Uh, I was surprised to learn that they were even found in waterproof makeup and things like dental floss. And they're used in a variety of industrial uh, applications as well. And uh, you may have heard about the concern about PFAS chemicals being found and used in um, firefighting foam in, across the country uh, at military bases and airports and um, many different locations that are uh, currently dealing with water contamination issues with PFAS chemicals. So um, I don't know how many of you have seen or heard of the movie Dark Waters uh, starring Mark Ruffalo, but it is a true story and um, it talks about one of the first PFAS chemicals with widespread use uh, known as PFOA or PFOA for short. Um, it's been used to manufacture Teflon and the US uh, manufacturers voluntarily phased out production in 2015 after uh, numerous studies and information had come out about the adverse health effects associated with this uh, chemical and pollution that uh, was discovered in a community in West Virginia around a production plant. And so uh, due to this case that came out of the pollution in West Virginia, uh, a really large human health study was done that um, I think involved over 60,000 community members and PFOA exposure was actually linked to a number of health hazards such as colitis, thyroid disease, testicular cancer, kidney cancer, and pregnancy hypertension. Um, and again, PFAS is uh, a hormone disrupting, a uh, group of hormone disrupting compounds. And it's very concerning, as I mentioned, because they can affect the body at extremely low levels. And there's a recent study uh, review that found that there's a strong evidence between PFAS and a variety of hormone related diseases. It's also a concern right now because of concerns with our uh, effects on our immune system. So there's uh, uh, findings from the National Institute for Environmental Health Sciences um, found that PFAS exposure actually reduces the immune response to vaccines such as diphtheria and tetanus boosters. So the um, PFAS chemicals that are uh, typically used in food service applications are known as fluorotelomer alcohols or FTOH for short. There are studies that have been shown that they migrate from foodware into food um, that shows they have estrogenic activity and they're linked to a variety of other health effects um, and that they actually can uh, stay in our body for about a year. So um, CEH, you know, because we started looking into this issue of PFAS in food service where back in 2017, we started out by testing a variety of these products, uh, single use products, the plates, bowls, clamshells, and food trays primarily um, for the presence of PFAS. And what we found was that virtually all the molded fiber products, which are the ones um, that people who are more sustainably minded have been tending to buy, thinking these are more environmentally friendly and, and preferable. They're the um, products typically marketed as compostable that are made of sugar cane or bagasse or wheat straw, um, even recycled paper. Uh, and we ended up finding high fluorine levels, which is an indicator of the use of PFAS. And these chemicals are being used in these products primarily to impart water and grease resistance to these products. The problem is they can stick around for a long time and end up in our food compost and the landfills. So this is a chart that just shows um, the findings, the different kinds of products we tested. 
And the good thing here with this chart is that when we first came out with our findings in 2018, pretty much 100% of all the molded fiber products we tested had PFAS in it or high levels of fluorine. And now, um, as we've been testing and the market is changing, we're starting to see new reformulated products come to market that don't contain PFAS. Um, and so we'll be talking about that a little bit more uh, in a minute on how you can identify which ones these are. Uh, another thing I just wanted to mention is we didn't um, test any polystyrene or styrofoam type products because we don't recommend that purchasers use them. Um, and so we just wanted to have a note here to point out that we're also encouraging purchasers to avoid polystyrene or number six whenever possible. So um, CEH has a public database of all our findings and the products we've tested. It's all um, publicly available. We try to provide as much information as possible uh, down to the SKU numbers of the products and where you can find them um, to, to you know, give you the best uh, information that we can about which ones to avoid and which ones don't have PFAS. Um, and, you know, there's been a lot of information and, and a, a great job by many, many groups talking about the concerns of single-use plastic. So, um, you know, we're not going to go into that much here, but there's a lot of resources and information um, talking about all the concerns with single-use plastic. They're based, um, petroleum-based, and um, they don't typically end up getting recycled. There's a lot of um, concerns with actually the ingredients also in a lot of the plastic products, um, toxic chemicals being used, and then also all the energy and the um, resources that go into producing these products. Same thing with the um, uh, compostable and fiber-based products though, because all of these products, they're single use. There's a lot of resources and energy and materials that go into creating these things that are used for as little as five minutes to you know maybe half an hour um, typically so <clears throat> we're uh, you know just recommending to people as much as possible to look for ways to eliminate single-use foodware and go towards reusables whenever you can um, so the, the thing we just mentioned about uh, compostable products, you know, there's just this assumption that, oh, well, if it's uh, compostable or marketed that way, or saying it's biodegradable, which actually doesn't really mean much, it's compostable has a definition and um, associated with it about the time frame and the conditions for, you know, when it will break down. And, and um, when we are talking about compostable here, we're talking about uh, typically for commercial composting facilities. So a lot of these products that you end up buying or using typically every day, um, when they're marketed as compostable, it's intended to go to a commercial uh, facility. And unfortunately, a lot of places around the US still don't have adequate commercial composting capability, but um, we're really encouraging you know, you in your area, if you don't have it, to be asking for that and trying to push to get commercial composting of food waste um, happening in your area. And um, if it doesn't go, if you have a compostable product and it doesn't go to a commercial composting facility but ends up in a landfill, there's concerns about um, the creation of harmful greenhouse gases when it's breaking down in the landfill. But um, so we are recommending to purchasers to look for uh, certifications. There's a program um, run by the Biodegradable Products Institute or BPI. They certify products in North America as compostable and commercial facilities. And they had not had PFAS on their radar as did most people um, prior to the last few years. So they changed their standard and as of the beginning of this year, they no longer allow anything that has PFAS to be certified under their program as compostable, which is terrific. So you now have a place to turn to, to look. If you wanna find a compostable product, you can go to BPI's list and look for 
um, anything on their list will not have PFAS in it. And um, the other step you actually need to take though is to actually talk to your local compost facility to make sure, even if it's BPI certified, you still need to make sure that your local facility can actually accept and compost that particular product. So it's important to make sure you take that extra step. And there's another group, which I can talk about on the next slide, um, uh, that also uh, certifies these products as compostable. But before we do that, I did wanna point out, as far as the reusables go, um, there's a lot of great information out there about the benefits of going to reusables and um, a lot of great case studies put together by a program under Clean Water Action um, called Rethink Disposable. So there's a link there. And they have done a ton of case studies with restaurants and businesses showing that they've actually saved money as well as uh, resulted in a lot of environmental benefits. And the last point I just want to make on this slide is that, um, you know, even though there's, uh, you know, plastic foodware um, and sometimes the paper foodware, you know, might technically be considered recyclable, often these things don't get recycled or your local facility just can't take it. It's either too contaminated with food waste or uh, a lot of the recycling programs have been struggling um, with some of the changes that have been happening in the world and with China's uh, change policy and restricting what they're taking. Um, just because it's foodware, it's just even more difficult. And so, um, you know, it's just not really likely to be recycled. So it's, it's, a, it's a difficult choice, which is why we're promoting reusables. So um, I already mentioned BPI and um, the other uh, certification for compostability is a group called the Compost Manufacturing Alliance which is made up of, I believe, six uh, large composters around the country that have come together and they field test products through their facilities to ensure that these things compost and break down properly. So they um, actually have a list of products they field tested in these different um, composting techniques. And as of January 2021, everything on their list will be free of PFAS. They, um, are just a, a year behind BPI's uh, timeframe. Uh, really quickly, I just wanna say that, uh, you know, again, polystyrene or people often call it styrofoam. Um, there's a lot of concerns about this product. You all are familiar with, uh, you know, just the, the fact that these styrofoam products break down into smaller and smaller pieces. They don't actually, uh, you know, degrade really properly. They just go into smaller, smaller pieces. They end up in the food chain. Um, the building block of these products is styrene, which is reasonably anticipated to be a human carcinogen and has been shown to migrate from the foodware into food. So it's very uh, concerning and is very, very difficult to recycle, uh, contrary to what the industry might tell you. So, um, Lastly, you know, there's been concern because of COVID around um, the safety of reusables. People uh, kind of didn't know what to do when the news came out about it and the shelter in place orders and things really um, were just, a lot of unknowns were there. And so as we've been in this now for months and more research has come out and it's clear though that there's, Reusables are safe uh, as long as you have good protocols in place for cleaning and sanitizing um, and making sure that, uh, you know, it's handled as little as possible. It's going to be um, pretty much the same touch points for a single use versus a, a reusable product. But the, the difference is that you don't end up with all the waste and the pollution and the problems associated with the life cycle of all the single use products. So there's a statement that came out by uh, a number of scientists about the safety of reusables. There's a lot more uh, resources available on the safety and benefits of reusables. And then finally, um, CEH came out with recommendations for purchasers around, um, you know, things to consider for sustainable <laughs> food service wear. And you can find all this information on our website uh, at www.ceh.org slash foodware. Um, 
and we'll be also happy to follow up and send any additional information to folks that are interested afterwards. So um, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Jackie Dillenbach, um, who's gonna talk about what they're doing in their school, or her two school districts around uh, reusables. Thank you very much, I appreciate that. Hello everyone. I have to tell you I'm thrilled to be able to talk about what we've been doing. I'm going to dive right in. Um, as we were told, I'm the director of food services for a couple of different school districts here in Massachusetts. I wanted to start this screen, <clears throat> excuse me, with a picture that I took uh, as I was flying over the salt flats. I was coming back from Arizona over the summer seeing my daughter. And um, I just, it really knocked me over to look at this picture because it seemed so vast and so huge and so unmanageable. And as I was looking at these, I thought that's pretty much how I feel since we've had this entire uh, pandemic situation, very overwhelming. Uh, and so I decided to use that to start. Um, why school food service? Both Dennis and I are in school food service. And I will tell you, that um, as, as trying as it has been for us in the uh, recent months, I'm an eternal optimist and I'm sure we can handle all of this, pretty much do anything. So I'm excited to show you what we've done on our end. Oh. And we'll move to March, 2020, COVID-19 uh, became a crisis for our nation and all of our schools began closing. And I'll tell you, school food services went into overdrive. Kids were at home, but we still needed to feed them. Um, in my area, we have quite a substantial amount of children that are food insecure. So it was really important that we brainstormed and talked to each other and came up with a way that we could continue to feed these guys at home. I was already using reusable dishes in my school districts at the time, and suddenly, much to my dismay, I realized that I needed to move into the world of disposables because I certainly couldn't send trays home to these kids. You know, for years I've worried about toxic chemicals that we're consuming in all of these things and the life cycle of some of these products, as Sue was saying, you know, it's true, manufacturers have worked really hard to create biodegradable, compostable products over the last several years, there's no question about it. But, this is my favorite but, if they aren't in perfect situation, perfect temperatures, perfect moisture, and they're in a plastic bag in the landfill, they're not going to biodegrade or compost. So it has to be a really specific situation to make that happen. Um, so what had ended up happening was I realized very quickly we're saying, okay, what are we going to use? Do we use paper? Do we use coated paper, uncoated paper, foam? You know, everybody's doing something different. And unfortunately, it always comes down to money. And that is really frustrating. We were all really scrambling to figure out what made sense while getting food out to these kids. Um, and then we realized there was uh, very high demand and shortages for most of the products that all of us were using. And that created a whole other set of obstacles. Uh, so I started thinking to myself, what can we do? I mean, we are such a phenomenal group of, of people. We all work together across the country in our own chapters, in our own states, and we share our information. And I, I say this quite honestly, you know, school food service, these are unsung heroes without question. They have been on the front lines since day one. And I figured if there was going to be any group that could make this happen, it was going to be this one. There's 208 million students in this country. It's a lot. We have a large captive audience. So true. We see them every single day, and our teams are really driven. Anything that we do typically in the SNA or in school food services, there immediately you see the difference. They're very impactful. And I was certain if I reached out to my colleagues, we could do something. So that's what I did. Um, I began talking with them and sharing my concerns for what we were seeing and what was coming. And uh, I, was, I was told that there was a lot of folks that their administrations had said, 
you know, what we want disposables because of the safety concerns. And they felt that it wasn't going to be, uh, they weren't going to be able to clean them enough. And, and I wasn't having it, quite frankly, because it's absolutely not the case. Schools in, in our country have the cleanest kitchens anywhere. Uh, far better than restaurants and anywhere else that you go. Having owned restaurants and you scramble every minute of the day, it's pretty incredible to see the difference in what we do now. Um, when we use reusables, quite frankly, we maintain control of the cleanliness of our product. I, I will never accept the argument that a, a paper or um, any kind of disposable product that's coming off of the machine and being put into a box is any safer than something that I know that has been that has gone through HACCP and all of the safety protocols that we need to do. Uh, of course, when we started this, uh, we expected we'd be back in school in a couple of weeks, certainly not um, by, by nine months, and I needed a better solution. So it was time to move forward and figure out what else was going on. So I decided at that point, rather than reinvent the wheel, I wanted to look at what was happening in Europe and other parts of the world because they started this a little bit earlier than we did. And I wanted to see what was happening with them. Um, but my bigger concern at this point with the disposables and feeling forced to do it is what about all the garbage? Where are we going to put it? If you can imagine the volume of students and volume of schools in this country using disposables every single, every single day is just, it's over. So globally, I wanted to see what was going on. So we're going to look at Germany. There's a couple of things that you'll see that all of these countries have in common. These are typical standard school meals. I mean, yes, we're not serving sausage here, but that's not my point. You can see that it is on a beautiful plate and served very nicely. I went further to see how long your classes were, how long the breaks are between classes, and more specifically, how long was their lunch period. And I'll tell you why I think that's important as we get farther along. Students in Germany also help to prep and clean up their meals. South Korea, reusable dishes. Beautiful lunch, isn't it? Everybody seems to be using reusables. Now in South Korea, uh, recycling and respect for the planet is a, an incredibly big deal. You will be shamed if you are wasteful. And it was actually much like that when I lived in Japan, which was interesting because they have a, a lot different structures in place for this, and they all use these. Um, you don't waste food. It's very shameful. And going back for seconds is great. But you'll also see here Staff and students are eating together and cleaning up together. Fascinating. We'll move on to France, and I won't go through every country, I promise. France, uh, again, reusables. Lunch in their recess is two hours. Students participate in cooking and cleaning, and food and cooking is a, uh, is a life skill. We've gotten very far away from that in our schools in, over the last several years. Last but not least, I go to Finland, something a little more random. Again, they're using reusables. This is not a new thing. Most countries are using them. They have a one-hour lunch, 15-minute break in between classes, which is terrific, 45-minute classes. And again, students are cooking and cleaning. Now, the reason I bring this up is because I think that that is a really big part of the problem that we face in school food service, is that we don't have time to eat. The kids don't have time to eat. We are rushing, rushing, rushing. And a lot of that is um, our culture, <clears throat> obviously. I put a little fun fact over here in the corner. My husband was stationed in Bosnia for a while, and he just thought it was so incredible that if he wanted a cup of coffee, he actually went to a cafe and asked for a coffee to go, and they thought it, they had no idea what he was talking about. If he wanted coffee, he sat down and he drank coffee. Same in Italy, same in many other European countries. Now we're going to have a look at America's typical school lunch. Not typical for all of us, but it's a common lunch. Good, bad, or otherwise, we live in a fast food, fast food society. We are always going a thousand miles an hour. School food service departments have to prepare food with very small budgets. Um, and so what ends up happening, if you're in a financial crunch and you need to save money, sometimes the first place that we look is staffing. Because it's cheaper to use disposables than it is to have someone working there. 
that much time. And that's a really common place that people will begin to cut. I don't agree with it, but it is, it is what happens. Uh, a lot of us use both the combination of reusables and disposables. In America, we have 20 minute lunch periods. Our classes are 45 to 90 minutes, and there's three minute changes in between. So we have a much higher amount of food waste. We have a lot less time, so disposables are easy, and they're quick, and they cut down time. And that's a good reason why a lot of them use them. Let's talk about money. We're going to look at nationwide, and this is a very simple, I just want you to understand immediately the, the volume of what we're doing here. And, and it's little thing I put together, because the, uh, the argument that you'll also hear from your administration is that we can't afford it. That's going to cost too much money. Uh, there's no money in the system. Your budget's in the black. Right now, our budgets are a mess across the country. Food services are having a really hard time keeping their head above water. And so I think that you'll agree when Janice and I are finished with this, is, is that this may actually be a way to save the budgets and to help you to get beyond them. Now, imagine two pieces of disposable product each meal, two meals a day. We're going to pretend it's foam because it's cheap, and it's going to give you an idea of what I'm talking about. So that's two meals a day, four pieces of a child, 208 million pieces of foam in one day. And you can see the, the uh, financial figures here. It's pretty incredible. If you were to buy a reusable tray or a container at $3.50, that's going to cost you $91,000 over the course of the two years, a billion eight hundred and seventy-two million dollars and our investment of reusables is still $91,000. Think about that. It's a tremendous amount of money. What is even more exciting is what I would say is, is putting that money back into our programs, into keeping people, into being able to offer better foods, into permanent fixtures and reusable products. We have got to do something. I believe that this is possible. And I, I was able to find um, a product myself, which is made from recycled plastic and it's also recyclable. I was so excited I couldn't stand it because it, it's, it's a win-win all the way. It is possible and I think your school nutrition program can have a really big impact in the state of the world. And it's something that we can easily do together. This is a team like none other. And when we get our, our mindset on things, they happen. Um, pushbacks from staff, just to kind of go over that again, is we don't have time. Uh, it is a challenge. It's a challenge for directors, for managers, for cooks, for students. They don't have as much time as they need to eat. And that's a different conversation we can certainly have. And I hope that you'll address your own local governments about it, because I think it's a terrible situation. Just making it. Um, staff members have very little time in between their lunches. And I think until we recognize and address the program structure of our school meals programs, we need to focus on what we can control. Obviously, though I have been trying for 22 years, we still have a 20 minute lunch period. They don't, they aren't listening to me. So we're going to look at what we can do that's tangible and in front of us. And certainly some ideas are adjusting the staff schedules so that we have more hands on deck during the meal times. Uh, these reusable products are working really well for serving in the classroom. Right now, we had a real issue with uh, using reusables with an open tray. During COVID, I want it sealed. I want it protected so that nothing in transit can, can be uh, an issue in that. Classroom uh, dining is the CDC recommendation. There are much smaller groups, there's no lines. Um, so that frees up your staff during what would typically be a chaotic lunch period to be able to spend more time washing the reusables, et cetera, et cetera, as long as this goes on. Um, and keep your staff employed. I think that's also important. We've all certainly been hit hard in that regard. So reach out to your school communities also. Kids today are so much more aware of the environments of their environment. Um, actually, a couple of years ago, the green team came to me and we went from plain flat trays with plates on them to five compartment trays because it was less water usage. And so we've been sort of gradually getting better and better at it. But you have 
green teams and student council to pull up programs that are all really willing to help you. And you know, the second piece of it is um, when you get the pushback from fear about it not being sanitary clean, I don't allow that narrative. I don't agree with it. School kitchens are so sanitary. Their health departments will back us up on this. I know they will. We're, we're the easiest stop that they go to. And they do check on us regularly. And we are very serious about what we do, what we do. And as you saw in the previous slide, reusables are much more cost effective. Um, that was a conservative estimate of the impact nationally. You think about the fact that most of us are using paper and we're paying 25 cents a piece for those. Those numbers are 250% higher. We've got to find another way. Um, I believe that we have, for, for my district, I know that we have. The other thing I want you to consider when we talk about money and why our school uh, food service departments are struggling to keep their heads above water during all of this is this is fascinating actually. The only revenues that we have in school food service come from the federal government and from a small amount from our state. We aren't in the school budgets, we don't have funding from anywhere else. And I got thinking about this. Um, how did we get to where we are, where we're struggling? Have a look at our reimbursements over the last 30 years. There, I, I did it in five year groups or eight year groups depending. So in the course of 30 years, as you can see, our paid lunches, which is, you know, the kids are paying 275 or $3, and then the federal government gives us 32 cents. Reduced, they pay 40 cents, the government gives us $2.14. You see where I'm going with that, or $2.14 more now than they did 30 years ago. To me, that's preposterous. Uh, disposable cut down the workload, and eventually in the hybrid model, we'll be doing classroom feeding. And I, these will be available to you also. This is the particular product that I chose. Um, I know that we can do this and uh, we're really the group to do it. So I hope that you'll consider it. It's, it's easier than you think. And, and with that, I will turn it over to Janice, who's gonna go a bit more into the financial things. And I appreciate your time so much. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, it's a, definitely a pleasure to um, talk with you today. And thank you, Sue, for uh, the fabulous information and Jackie as well. Um, knowing more of the background of where we're coming from to where we're going is, is definitely key. So we, uh, as we all know, work to try to consider some uh, transitions to more healthy uh, products. So I was wondering if you could um, go ahead and advance the slide. So this is just a little bit about me. I'm located in central Massachusetts. Our school district has five schools uh, with around 2,700 uh, students and we're right within one municipality. So as we all know, we had to make a lot of decisions in a very little bit of time. Um, March uh, 13th, uh, I was worlds away in another country and um, had to quickly uh, make decisions about how we were going to move forward. Uh, we jumped in right away with using disposables, uh, but we knew over time that this would not be a sustainable option for us for, as you can see, um, you know, a, a variety of reasons. So next slide. So our first steps in this process was to really look at menus. We had a substantial amount of uh, USDA foods. We're a very uh, food driven uh, school district. We make a lot of our own food and we had to try and figure out ways to provide this food um, you know, to students uh, from uh, uh, pickup and you know, meals to go type of a location. We had production planning decisions, how to get food from various locations from within our school district to make this process possible. But we knew we had to start with disposable containers. But our growing realizations had to do with um, all of the health impacts. And I've learned a significant amount more even today with uh, Sue's presentation um, about how single service uh, surface wear is a true growing concern for us all. We, and I don't think the general public and even all of us who are in this industry have any idea about some of these long-term uh, and short-term impacts, whether it's for the environment or for our, our health. And of course, we're focused on trying to um, uh, make sure our children are healthy and well, and we can't conscionably uh, continue uh, to preserve our food in all of these disposable containers. So that was our realization. We had to make some quick decisions. 
Um, but I just want to touch base on one of the pieces was about our next steps. They had to do with the, our financial position. We as a school district were, were definitely in a very good financial position to make this decision about, you know, what work our next steps going to be. We knew over time it was going to become a supply and demand issue. We were backlogged and backordered on many containers, and we, we had sourcing issues. Prices were going up. Even though we had competitive collaborative bids, um, our prices were still continuing to rise. So we knew the per meal cost was going to be significantly impacted by the cost of bringing in disposables on a regular basis. So roundabout, um, I would say, first part of April, we began to think about other solutions because we had anticipated that this would not be a short-term concern for us, that it was probably gonna go into the summer, into the fall to start the school year, and we had to be prepared for the fall to open up our schools with either hybrid learning, learning models or a combination of hybrid and remote learning. So finally, uh, you know, finding our solutions, it was a journey and a process of discovery. Uh, many uh, containers that we had um, access to were extremely expensive. That would be a reusable type container. We knew we had to keep searching. Our discovery process had to do with, um, you know, collaboration, you know, looking at other um, school districts or other suppliers. We sought first uh, to look at Amazon. We looked at um, IKEA, of other places. Um, but then we had a, a connection with um, Jackie uh, through our school nutrition association groups and she was talking about a container that I was extremely curious about and as soon as I saw it I requested samples, brought the product in, tested it with you know food prepared, uh, put in the containers, you know planned the uh, time delivery to the classroom and we knew we, we were onto something. So I want to thank Jackie again for that. <laughs> so but we found our reusable container. This is one of maybe others, but we knew this was a recyclable and a reusable container all in one. As you can see, there's two different models. The orange containers we selected for our K through two um, group, which has a smaller meal component requirement. And then the larger container, the upper left-hand corner is the green container, which was for our grades three through five. So how would these numbers work? We just did some projections initially looking at the price of containers for doing in-classroom feeding and we knew that um, in about six weeks the cost of one container could be recouped. So for me that was a no-brainer. It wasn't going to take me a year to recoup the cost of that container. Six weeks was, you know, let's go. When do I order them? You know, how do I get them in? Um, but we needed to anticipate, you know, in every school district, you know, you'll have to anticipate what that budget impact is. But over the course of uh, our three months of service in the spring, it, it was thousands of dollars that I spent on disposables. And I knew with um, half my students in K through five that that would be served in a classroom that I would be cutting my disposable costs at least in half. So again, the decision was, was made. So ready for service. You know, here's a sample slide of um, my staff actually preparing, you know, putting meals into these containers. You know, um, meal uh, menu process was something that we had to you know, figure out how we could do this and do it effectively and put the hot food in in with the cold food. So. Um, there is some logistics planning, but we've been able to work everything out and have HACCP plans, standard operating procedures for all of these. So this usable, reusable containers, you can see this is a picture of a, um, a K through two meal in the reusable container. Some components are on the outside of that container. And, you know, this, this is delivered on a cart, you know, to the classroom. We, we um, meet the teacher at the classroom door and hand off um, the food to the, the um, to, to the teacher and the students. Okay, and this is a meal that we've actually served in our grades three through five. Uh, you know, as you can see, it's very colorful. That's another thing that we wanted to focus in on, you know, having students actually eat in dis off of disposable products for the course of a potentially a whole school year. It was not a fine dining experience. We wanted to have students have a, a joyful experience, a, a colorful experience, and uh, we, we are seeing really good meal participation because of it. And I can say in some of the school districts that are using a lot of um, disposable products and they're using prepackaged foods, sometimes their participation isn't always there. And this will help us stay sustainable over the course of the next year. So next slide. 
<clears throat> you can see the wells are actually really deep too that you can actually put food in. So our last step was really how were we gonna wash these containers and what made sense. We already had dishwashers. We already had um, the, uh, the dishwashing equipment materials. It made sense for us to go ahead and move to this. We did have a challenge though that water quality has always been an issue uh, for us. We have mineral deposit on our container. So um, we had to come up with a solution and we did. So this is actually our drying rack for our um, reusable containers. It's a space saving drying rack and very easy and very effective for us to actually wash the containers in our dishwasher, hang them on these racks for drying and everything runs along beautifully. And the, 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 contain, the cart is actually covered over and uh, then the uh, trays are actually available for the next day. So we do anticipate more options to be available soon. We're also looking to a, a container for milk because we're looking or, and, you know, other types of beverages that we can provide students. So we're looking at packaging machines, which we have already another company that we're working with um, to create um, something that could be helpful for us too that's reusable. So I think the innovation will continue. And many of the things that we are doing already with this, these two containers, I think will continue even beyond our you know, current um, circumstances with the, the COVID-19. It's working in the classroom. I remember growing up, um, maybe some of you are on this call that um, have also experienced it, but we used to eat in the classroom all the time. It was, it was the norm. The cafeteria setting is, is maybe not always going to be here. You know, we may be choosing to do classroom feeding down the road. Next slide. So we hope you know you do consider using these reusable containers. You can certainly contact Jackie or myself, um, but I think your students will really appreciate and long remember um, their dining experience uh, with a reusable container. It, it makes it, it makes sense financially for your school district. It makes sense for kids, um, for the environmental impact for our world, and for the environmental impact for the health of children. So I think um, you know this is really really important um, that we. Now, do branch out and we reach each other um, to consider more reusable containers. Thank you very much. Keep in touch with me and uh, Jackie. You know, if you have any questions at all, we can certainly provide contact information uh, for suppliers and um, be assisting to you in any way. But good luck. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for participating today. Great. Thank you so much for that, Sue, Jackie, and Janice. We are a little short on time, so we're going to hop right into a little bit of a Q&A. Quick reminder, the slides and materials will be available after the webinar has concluded as well. So going through these questions, um, to Jackie and Janice, do your school districts have a centralized kitchen model? And what is the choreography for washing the containers? So what does that, uh, that structure look like? Sure. Um, we do not have a centralized kitchen. Um, we are um, utilizing these containers in three of our schools. Uh, the wear washing, uh, the trays actually come back. Uh, we use busing carts where uh, the, the actually trays are actually stacked. Um, the compartment trays are stacked inside this busing cart. And then we wash the dishes and then we, you know, put them on the racks for drying. Same, same. Thank you. That's exactly what we do as well. Okay, great. Um, here's a question for Janice. Can you talk more about your labor impact? How, do you know how staff time was either increased or decreased after using reusables from washing? Um, there's been no, no, impre no increase, um, but there has been a decrease. Um, we've seen um, some substantial changes in our ability to fill containers quicker and faster than if they were served on a serving line waiting for children to come up to the serving line. So the time to actually fill these containers is very quick. It's been a cost savings. Um, can you provide the name of the products that you use and maybe the company name as well? It's just one of probably many companies, but it's um, Oliver Packaging Company here in Massachusetts. Great. Um, here's another question. So Jackie, you highlighted the need for a kind of cultural and behavior, behavioral shift on how we engage with our waste and how we perceive food. Do you think it may be beneficial to engage students and parents and teachers kind of from that bottom level to try to get them to get their schools to adopt reusables? I do. It's, it's a little bigger than that, unfortunately. It's more uh, from the state time on learning what's necessary in the classrooms, what teacher contracts look like, and 
how much time you're adding to their day, because essentially we're talking about either shortening classes or adding time to the actual day to do that. But I think it's a conversation that this country needs to have, because I do believe that uh, being so rushed all the time is contributing to a lot of different issues, um, not only waste and uh, health and obesity and all those things, but mental health as well. And I think it is all tied together, whether or not we're contaminating our children with chemicals from our products or um, not giving them time to eat it. I think it's all really important. Thank you. Here's a, a question to you, Jackie. They know that one of the issues in Minneapolis public schools uh, transitioning to reusables is not just the cost of the products, but the need to hire more people in the cafeterias to collect and wash the dishes and also to educate students so they don't throw the reusables away. How would you address this? Oh my goodness, it's something that we have addressed actually. And, and as Janice had um, alluded to, it's actually a lot less work to use these containers. And I find that I'm able to take those same staffing hours and put that more towards um, creating better things, doing more cooking, those sorts of things. So it's really been a win-win for us, actually. And the kit, these containers are bright and beautiful. The kids wouldn't even think about throwing them away. Right now, it's not an issue because they're in the classroom. So we're picking them up on bus carts and bringing them back. Great, thank you. I do realize that we are at the hour. I do want to be respectful of everyone's time. Um, Sue, do you have any final questions or comments you'd like to make before we close out? Um, I guess, you know, I, I'm really just glad to see so many folks interested in, um, you know, schools returning and other businesses returning to reusables. There's a lot of questions that we didn't get to, so we will work on um, trying to get the answers to those questions from both Jackie and Janice and, and myself and um, maybe send that in a follow-up communication. Okay, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Great. Thanks, Thanks so much. Sue. Take Have care, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.